day, every single day, I wake up and take what I somewhat bitterly call my breakfast, which is the collection of pills that you see behind me. And in fact, I will have this breakfast every single day until I die. And that is actually the good news. Because in fact, I'm very well aware as a physician of the fact that the drugs that I take don't just go to the places in my body they're supposed to go to do the things they do, they actually go everywhere. And what they do in those other places can be whatever. Drugs all have defined toxicities. And that toxicity can limit therapy, or it can hurt the patient, or actually kill the patient. And for that reason, researchers, including me, have long been very interested in getting drugs to preferentially go to the places that you would like them to go. And that has not been easy, because the body is not designed to allow that to happen. And every time you overcome one obstacle, you often find that there is another one behind it. So what I'd like to share with you today is some examples uh, along the path of discovery that has led me and others to develop some degree of targeting of drugs to the desired location. So before I became a pediatric intensive care doctor, I did a pediatric residency, during which I often diagnosed kids with um, you know, the conventional middle ear infection or otitis media, and I would often, or at least dutifully, prescribe antibiotics. Now those antibiotics would be taken by mouth and go throughout the body to get to the ear where the infection was, and along the way would cause a variety of hopefully minor side effects, but would also encounter a lot of innocent bystander bacteria, which would then potentially become resistant to the drugs. And as you all know, antibiotic resistance amongst bacteria is a major public health problem. So what Manny Simons, Xiao Ku, Homer Chang, and I developed was a drug-containing hydrogel which would be applied by the pediatrician at the time of diagnosis. It was designed so it would uh, pour onto the um, eardrum easily, and then once it was there, it would form a nice form gel. The gel also contained a special molecule called a chemical permeation enhancer, which would cause the eardrum to become more permeable to drugs, allowing the drugs to enter the middle ear and kill the bacteria without having to go throughout the entire body to get there. Another circumstance where treating just the organ of interest is important is in many ocular diseases like glaucoma. Now, there actually are already very effective ways of just targeting the eye, like eye drops. The problem with eye drops in diseases like glaucoma is that patient adherence with the regimen that is created by the physician is usually very poor for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, the onset of blindness is really insidious. Also, it can be technically difficult for patients to apply eye drops, and also as the regimen becomes more complicated and you have to give the drug more times per day, it really gets to be a drag. So to address this problem, Joe Ciolino and I developed a drug-releasing contact lens. It's basically a regular contact lens, prescription or non-prescription, which contains a polymer film, and that film releases a drug by diffusion. And Joe and I showed, uh, in rabbits at least, that we can get therapeutic levels of drug for many weeks from a single application of, or a single continuous application of one of these contact lenses. Now, in these two examples, our job was made easy by the fact that these target tissues are basically on the surface of the body. What if the target is deeper inside the body? Well, as it turns out, a really good way to get things deep inside the body is by a good old-fashioned needle. But in that case, you have to make your drug delivery systems small enough so they can fit through a needle, i.e. they can be injectable. So for example, to treat chronic pain, where you would target a nerve, Hila, Epstein, Barash, and I developed microparticles, such as the one you see here, which contained a very powerful combination of local anesthetics. And from a single injection in rats, we could get nerve blocks lasting a week with minimal systemic toxicity. Now, these particles are four millionths of a meter in diameter. To put that in perspective, if one of these particles was the size of a softball, I would be 
27 miles tall, okay, much higher than Mount Everest, and with my head deep in the stratosphere. And there are actually many formulations existing today in clinical use which have um, particles in this size scale. But what if the anatomic location you're trying to get to isn't well enough defined to get there via a needle, or if it would be impractical or unsafe to use a needle? In such circumstances, researchers have started to use the intravenous route to get there. And to do so, they have turned to the nanoscale to do things in drug delivery that would not otherwise be possible. So the nanoscale is a poorly defined domain where objects are somewhere between a millionth and a billionth of a meter in diameter. To put that in perspective, if you took a particle which was 100 nanometers in size and made it the size of a softball, the microparticle I just told you about would be more than 14 meters in diameter, and I would be more than 1,000 miles tall with my head deep in outer space. Now, these nanoparticles have many useful properties. One of them is that they are small enough to go throughout the bloodstream without clogging blood vessels, which is obviously important. The other is that they are small enough to be able to percolate into some tissues. They are particularly good at percolating into tissues where the blood vessels are leaky, like tumors, and therefore they tend to accumulate prefer preferentially inside tumors. And there are therapies on the market right now and in development which use nanoparticles to deliver chemotherapy to patients. But what if the target tissue doesn't have particularly leaky blood vessels? What do you do then? So many nanoscientists have turned to what is called active targeting. And active targeting comes in many forms. In one form, we take advantage of the fact that some disease tissues express specific molecules to a much greater degree than in healthy tissues. And these are called disease markers. We also take advantage of the fact that there, there may be second molecules called ligands which stick to these disease markers. And so what nanoscientists do is they put those ligands on the nanoparticles and hope that the ligand will bring the nanoparticle to the diseased tissue. As one example, which is illustrated behind me, Tal Dvir and I um, took advantage of the fact that in um, heart attacks, the part of the heart that is starved of oxygen tends to overexpress a protein called angiotensin II receptor type 1. So what we did is to attach a ligand to that protein on nanoparticles. And when we injected it intravenously, it went all over the body, but landed preferentially in the part of the heart that was starved of oxygen, and not at all in the normal part of the heart. So what do you do, though, if the tissue you're trying to target doesn't have a known disease marker, or if it has one, but you don't have a known ligand to get there? In that circumstance, Tal Dvir and I developed a general approach where you would inject nanoparticles intravenously, and the nanoparticles would go throughout the body, but would only stop or do something wherever you would shine a light. To illustrate how uh, our approach to doing that, you took a we took a nanoparticle, and we covered it with a ligand, which would bind to just about any cell or tissue anywhere. But we prevented it from doing so by putting a special compound called a caging molecule on the surface. When we would irradiate the particle, the caging groups would come off, allowing the nanoparticle to bind to where, whatever tissue we had shone a light on. But what if the nanoparticle can get to the tumor or other target, but it can't get inside? So to address that problem, Rong Tong and I developed a system which did two cool things when you irradiate it with ultraviolet light. The first thing is that it would shrink, allowing it to penetrate more deeply into the tumor. The second thing is as it shrank, it would expel a drug inside the tumor. In this way, its ability to kill tumor was enhanced while minimizing systemic toxicity. Now, in both of the examples I just showed you, we used ultraviolet light. What's unfortunate about ultraviolet light is it doesn't penetrate very deeply into the body. What if the tumor is very deep inside the body? So in order to get deep inside the body, we switched to using near-infrared light. 
but the problem with near-infrared light is it doesn't have much energy, so it can't make particles do the kind of tricks that the nanoparticles I just showed you did. So here we took advantage of a very interesting phenomenon, which is that gold nanoparticles, when irradiated with near-infrared light, heat up. So Auni Barhumi and I created gold nanoparticles, which we covered in ligands, which would bind to just about any cell type anywhere. But we prevented them from doing so by covering them with a plush carpet of a special polymer. And what's special about this polymer is that it would contract, or rather collapse, when it was exposed to heat. And maybe you can see where this is going. So when we would irradiate these nanoparticles with near-infrared light, the nanoparticle would heat up, causing the polymer shell to collapse, exposing the ligands, allowing the nanoparticles to bind to cells wherever we shone the light. So what I hope I have shown you is that actually we have come a fairly long way in developing targeting, targeting strategies to get drugs to go exactly where we would like them to go. But there's still a long way to go. The good news is that there's a lot of really, really exciting developments going on across the globe to make this work better. And what we're seeing is particles coming online which are increasingly versatile and sophisticated. Also, what we're seeing is a convergence of technologies that previously used to be disparate. So for example, uh, there's a lot of research right now on combining imaging technologies with drug delivery technologies. And in that way, for example, doctors would be able to treat diseases while tracking their progression in real time. But what we're finding now is that really progress in this field is limited only by the imagination of the investigators and to some degree by reality. So for example, one can envision taking medications that are taken by mouth and marrying them to the sort of high-tech strategies that I showed you before so that, for example, intravenous delivery would not, no longer be necessary in order to achieve targeted drug delivery. Or if intravenous delivery was absolutely necessary, having ways using drug delivery systems to extend the effect of uh, the, these uh, delivery systems so that you don't have to inject as often, or having it so that from one injection you can get many repeated dosings over time. And in fact, we could, and people are doing this right now, get even more specific about the targeting. Targeting not just organs or cells, but targeting subcompartments of cells to really get down to the fundamentals of what causes disease, and so on. So what I hope to have shown you is that sometimes you, you can achieve really big things by thinking really small. And uh, my hope is that eventually all this one day will culminate in making my breakfast perfectly safe. Thank you for your attention.